John, welcome to the podcast. Pleasure. Thank you for, for joining me. Um, you had a wonderful career on the, on the pitch. Um, played for some fantastic clubs with and against some fantastic players. But today I want, I want you to share what your journey's been like because off the pitch, it's been um, probably that's been your biggest success story and your biggest battle. Um, but let's start with how you got into football. Take us back to when you was 15, 16 years old and, and the journey of, of how you became a professional footballer. Well, 15, 16, a lot happened before then because I, I grew up in Swansea and uh, my father played um, a good good level, a good amateur level, never quite made it professional. So I think um, in, in, a, in a country that is, you know, dominated by rugby, if you like, it's our number one sport, rugby in Wales. My fo- my school didn't have a football team and uh, it was all rugby. So um, I broke through and uh, I went to Luton for the very first time at 10 years of age during the school holidays and they really looked after me as, as a young boy, put me in good digs, put me in with good families and remember I'm 10, 10, 11, 12 years of age. So, so you, so Luton, they'd spotted you. So you left, the, yep. you left the family home and went and moved well, in. Well, what happened was I was going up in school holidays. There was there was a, a scout, a Luton Town scout, that had spotted me playing locally in Swansea for my local side, and uh, he then approached my dad after that particular game and said, "Look, I'm the local Luton Town scout. His name was Cyril Beach. He's from Merthyr Town. Played for Swansea himself with his brother Gilbert. Played for Wales." Um, and he approached my dad and said, look, I think your son's got great ability. We'd love to take him up to Luton to give him a trial, see how he gets on. So then what happens then is uh, throughout the summer holidays and the Easter holidays and the October break, whatever it is, I would go up to Luton. I'd meet other Wales players on the web like Kerry Hughes, Mark Pembridge in Cardiff on the train. And um, they would take me up with them. Uh, you you wouldn't do it now, 10, no, 11 no. years of age, you know, no. you wouldn't let you. But back then, you know, my, my father thought he was okay. He used to give me a bit of change in his pocket. Didn't have an awful lot of money. He used, he used to work on the doors. My dad, he's a big, strong man. He did a bit of scaffolding, um, but always made sure the family were fed and there was food on the table. Real old school man, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I'd go up to Luton and that's where it all started. I was going back and forth to Luton in the school holidays. And then at 14, I got I had a, a certificate came through the house uh, from Luton Town. Uh, David Pleat had signed it, the current manager. And it said, uh, we would like to off John, uh, offer John uh, a YTS scheme, a two-year scheme, yeah. £29.50 a week. <laughs> um, when I was 16, I was to leave school and go and join Luton on a full-time basis. And then I would be put in with a family. And, um, you know, you, you're basically on your own. Then you have to become a man almost overnight. You're getting yourself into the training ground and you're getting yourself here and there. And at 17, I managed to get a car and had a little bit more independence then. But that's when it all started, as young as 10, yeah. Lonely, was it, at that time, when you were, when you were sort of 14, 15 on that YTS journey? Was, was it a bit lonely for you? I wouldn't say lonely. I would. I would just say that you, you know you, you miss you miss your parents a little bit, but um, because you miss the day to day, your your mommy's cooking and you, you know yeah. your mother and father's Home love. For, yeah, but um, in general, it was you know I I was always an outgoing person. I was always a bit of a mixer anyway, and I would go down the road um, outside of my digs and play with the lads that just play around the corner out in the out in the the yard, you know. Yeah. Or, or, or the or the street. Um, that's what I was like. I was always a bit of a mixer. Growing up in Swansea, I had my regular friends. Growing up on that council estate, I always had a ball in my hand and was always hitting it against the wall or practicing headers or down the local school. It was always a case of I always had boys around me. I always had good friends. Um, Lut- Luton was where it started professionally. Can you remember where you were, or take me back to the time when you realised George Graham wanted you? Well, I, I know exactly where I was. I'd um, I'd played against Barnsley the week before. I'm 19 years of age. I've only made 55 appearances in Luton's first team, and some of them were sub appearances, and some of them I started. And um, I'd finished training on the training ground, and David Pleat said to me, "John, can you come and see me in my office later?" So I said, "Yeah, no problem." So I'm 
I'm immediately thinking he's going to drop me. But I'd scored the previous week against Barnsley. So my father always gave me a couple of tips as I was going through life. He said, whenever you shake somebody's hands, shake it firmly whenever you shake someone's hand. And if you're ever called into a meeting, bang the door hard. Now I'm 19, I'm like a raging bull. I think I think David Pleat's going to drop me. And I'm going to argue my case that I don't think I should be dropped. I'm 19, by the way, I'm not a senior pro. Um, so I go upstairs and... Uh, manager David Pleat uh, it's a Friday afternoon so I bangs his door and he says come in so I walked in and he's sitting there and he said look son he said um, I've had George Graham on the phone he said Arsenal have offered 2.5 million he said it's an awful lot of money it's a lot of money for us he said as a club it would help us out a great deal he said I'd like you to go home have a shave put a suit on he says we go and go meet George Graham so no agent Nothing, no phone calls. My dad wasn't there. Um, so went home. I had, I didn't have a tie. I didn't have a jacket at the time. So I borrowed my landlord, Mike's, um, Mike his name was, his jacket. And it was a tie and it was a Mickey Mouse tie. <laughs> so when you see the pictures, me, Chris, Kamara and George signed on the same day as Chris, you can see my tie. It's Mickey Mouse tie, and it? it's embarrassing. <laughs> but um, I put that on. We we go up to um, Avenel Road, of course, Highbury then, and I go through, um, and then you got the marble halls that are so so impressive. Arsenal. I go upstairs. I meet Ken Fryer at the time, um, who was the, I think he was the chairman or chief executive, or I think he was the chairman, Mister Fryer. And then I meet George, he's quite an imposing Scottish man, you know. Um, and uh, he said to me, look, John, how are you doing? Now? Nice to meet you. He said, I've been an admirer for a long time. And he said, look, he said, Alan Smith's turned his ankle this morning. He said, Kevin Campbell's hurt his knee. He said, if you sign for me today, he says, you will play out there, which was Highbury, looking through the windows from one of the offices. He says, with the current England centre forward. Of course, who was Ian Wright? So basically, I'm like, well, where's a contract? You know, no money spoken. Uh, I didn't have an agent. So I think I went on to something like um, from from £150 a week because I was a young pro at Luton from the age of 18 for about a year. I think I went on to about £2,500 a week, which was rising. But at that time, it wasn't about money. I was, I was just 19. I just wanted to play football. What a 24 hours. Incredible, incredible. I phoned my parents straight away. They made sure they were up for the next day. We played Everton, my big mate in goal, um, Neville Southall. Yeah. Duncan Ferguson got sent off and uh, we drew the game 1-1 and the, the great Ian Wright scored our equaliser. Played the full game, started the game and um, I, I felt good. I, I felt quite comfortable in the environment. You know, six or seven thousand a week at Luton, you're going into like 40,000 full house at Highbury. Yeah. But it's one of those, Ben, that I think when you're young, like you, you haven't got a lot of fear. I think you've got plenty of energy, you've got, you, you've got plenty of legs, plenty of desires, a stomach for a fight, if you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. And I think um, I, I was very much like that when I was young. I was off a council estate, I was quite wise for my age. And I always found it, more nerve-wracking as you got older because you got to test yourself more. Can I still do it? You know, when I was 32, when I moved to West Brom, Brian Robson signed myself and Kevin Phillips on the same day. And I'm thinking, can I still get across the front? When I'm 19, I knew I could do it. Yeah. You know, I'd push every other way to get there. When you're 32, you got, you've had a few weeks, you've had a 15-year career, you've had a couple of operations yeah. and... But I, I was like a raging bull. I, I was like a raging bull, and I can remember, I can remember going into Arsenal and training with Adams and Keown, and it was the England back four. Yeah, Winterburn, so. Seaman in goal, yeah. and it was Bird Camp, and it was Wright and Parler. You know, it, all uh, these great players across all of the clubs that you played for. Which, which was, which was the club that you had you that you that you love playing for the most? The one that you that one that just clicked, just felt. Felt right. Well, I've got to be honest. I was I was very young at Arsenal, so I, I I couldn't quite fit in because they'd won doubles. Yeah. 
you know, Tony Adams did captain England and these guys, you know, they were all international. So I did fit in as best as I could, but they'd all come through together. Yeah. Like Merce, Tony, Martin, they'd all come through the youth team together. So they'd been there and they'd won. They'd won that great match at Anfield in yeah. 1989, I think it yeah. was, where Mickey Michael Thomas, Thomas called yeah. the Michael Thomas. Um, so as much as I rightly made me feel very welcome, he was looking after me. I was a young boy in the dressing room and um, things like that. But, you know, I, I wouldn't say I didn't fit in, but it, it was difficult. I played in two European finals while I was there. I played in the Super Cup final because the year that I got there, Arsenal had, had won the um, the Cup Winners Cup the year before. They played Malmo and AC Milan had won the European Cup. Yeah. So you have that Super Cup then. Yeah, and I, I yeah. played... I played against a brilliant um, AC Milan team. Their, their back four at the time was Baresi, Maldini, Maldini left back, and yeah. Costa Curta. Um, Desai played, Costa, Donna yeah, Doni yeah, played. Yeah. They had unbelievable players, and I'm 19 playing at the playing at the new uh, playing San at Zero. the San Siro yeah. in front of 85,000 people. And it was the night, the first night we played AC Milan. It was Paul Merson's first game back after being in a priory. Merce, you know, had come out bravely and said that he'd had a few issues and problems. The club backed him and helped him and he kicked on. And um, But that was Merce's first game back as well, so that was quite exciting to play in that. Uh, but no, I, I wouldn't say I was overawed, but I never quite, you know, when I went to West Ham, then there was lads my own age there, you know, like Ian Bishop, John Moncur, Steve Lomas, um, young Rio, Frank, Joe Cole, Michael Carrick, all these guys. And that's when I really kicked on at West Ham. And my dad says to this day, John, my father never my father never missed a game right throughout until I was six years of age until I retired. Never missed me. Saw really? every game. Travelled around travel from Wales. Travelled around the world every wow. single game. Um and he said to me that the two years you had at West Ham, he said, That was your best. He said, I'd never seen you better than that. He said you were he said, you were flying out the sky like Superman. He says, you was battering everybody. You were shoving everybody out of the way. You were scoring goals. He said, you were a machine. He said, he couldn't talking of Talking of machines, the front three that you played in up at Celtic, what was that, 488 goals? Yeah, 448 goals between 48, us. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Sutton, Hartson, Larson. Yeah. Uh, and that, that would have been a pretty... Is that the best environment you played? So uh, incredible, incredible environment, incredible club. Um, you know, a, a global institution, Celtic, worldwide fame, um, fans everywhere. Um, you know, brilliant crowd. Um, and to play in front of that 60,000 every week was just a joy. You know, real, real joy. If you can score goals there, you know... I, I've been to about 100 different guest of honour Celtic functions in the last 10 years. You know, they remember their good players, they remember their loyalty, they remember they remember everything. And that's the thing, you know, players, managers go, they leave clubs, but fans always stay. Yeah, Fans are always the ones that are always there. Now, you mentioned one of your former teammates, Merce. He, he, he went into the Priory. He's one of the first sort of players, if you, if you like, in the modern game that came out and was talking about some of the battles that he's had. You've had some of your own battles during your playing days? Well, my playing days, I, was, I gambled. I, I gambled from a very young age and I, I carried that problem around with me. Um, it was something that I got on, got into. I didn't do drugs. I, I, I was never a big drinker. Uh, I never actually went out that much. It was, I was quite happy to stay with my family. I had a young wife and I had I had two children. I was never really the bright lights of London. It never really um, entertained me, really. It never really was my thing. Um, but the gambling, you know, I would sit in and I would gamble. And uh, I think it, it stemmed from a very young age in Swansea, being able to gamble. I worked in, I worked in, a, in, a, in one of these council sort of uh, clubs. And there was two... But one arm fruit machines, fruit machines. Was it the fruit there. machines? That and it was me. I was in the fruit machines, you know, from a young boy. The lights and the, you know all this, and and it got me. It got me hooked basically. And then when you start to earn bigger money, like I did, I went. I broke four clubs transfer records, you know. So I was one of the biggest, possibly not at Arsenal, but when I went to West Ham, I was arguably the biggest earner. I went to Wimbledon, I was biggest earner. Celtic. I was what, was your, what was your biggest uh, salary? 
You, you, you started at twenty nine pound fifty. I think I earned um, a week. I think I earned about two million a year at uh, Celtic. About forty grand a week at one stage. Um, wow. Yeah, which, which was good money then. Back yeah. in two thousand and one till two thousand and six, I was there. I was there just under six years. Good money, and don't get me wrong. I lived in a beautiful house. My wife had the best cars. I had the best cars. We travelled, we went on luxury holidays, um, nobody went without. And I sit here now and think, well, if I hadn't gambled, I might have had five of them houses. But at that particular time, I was doing something that I was having fun. We've all got things that we maybe look back and think I shouldn't have done that. Yes, it's a regret, but I was an addict. I was an addict. How long did it take you to realise that things were getting out of control? You never do. You never do until I hit rock bottom. Um, I think. What was it, rock bottom for you? Well, you have to hit that rock bottom place. A lot of, a lot of addicts, a lot of people that are in the midst of their addictions, it's rock bottom, where you've got nowhere else to go. You can't go any lower. You can only rise again then if yeah. you've got the capacity to rise. You know, and the heart and the fight and everything else you need and the mental strength to, to 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 kick on and 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 obviously. To, to have the mindset to, to beat this particular addiction. There's not just gambling, there's there's food, there's there, there's fitness, yeah. there's there's gaming, there's alcohol, there's drugs. There are so many addictions, it's, it's unreal. And the support network that you had, obviously you've got a, a very close and loving family, but yeah. do, do you feel the, the football in bodies or do you think there's support out there was there support for you at the time is there support now for current players that may or may not or that might be going through something similar yeah I think there's more support now I think I think most things now that you know mental health in particular is is is, is uh, affects quite a lot of people um quite badly as well and I think I think there is support now I think there's lots of places I think the one thing that you have to do which is imperative is, is, is talk to people, mm. you know, don't suffer in silence. You know, you have to share your problems and, and, and let somebody know. So there's someone there that's looking over you or caring for you or, but I've got to be honest, I, I don't even think with support, um, if somebody would have been there, told me not to gamble, I don't think I'd have listened because it's very difficult when you're an addict. And tw 12 years since you'd... 12 years now, 12 years abstinence from gambling. I wouldn't be in my house in Edinburgh. I wouldn't be with my wife. I wouldn't have the relationship I've got with my kids. Um, I'd either be dead or I'd be in jail. That's how bad it was for me at one stage. So I'm proud of that fact. And as you said there, uh, you know, the football was a really good career when I when I was in amongst the football. You know, it was my life. I loved the game. I still love the game. Um, but, you know, we might go on to the cancer in a minute. And obviously my gambling addiction and things like this... Um, these are the things I'm probably, without people knowing and seeing, it, you know, the bad times and stuff. Everybody saw me on the pitch. Everybody saw you very much in the public eye. But the things people don't see is what happens behind the camera, what happens between them four walls. And I've, I've got things that happen to me between them four walls that will always remain private to me. But those things are probably... 20 times more special to me than than the goals that I scored you know getting myself to in the position that I am today do you feel I've, I've had this conversation with a couple of retired elite athletes the transition period between playing in front of 50 60 70 thousand week in week out to then maybe getting that knock on the door you you go into another club or you're you're on, you go you're not on the decline but you know that you're how, how do you deal with that? It's difficult. Luckily for me, I I, I could talk. <laughs> Luckily for me, I was able to string a sentence together, and and I went I went immediately into the television. I was given a contract by Satanta. Yes. Two years. Uh, I was doing the Scottish football with Teddy Butcher. Uh, I was travelling back and forth up to do the the SPL at the time, the Scottish leagues. And I was doing other things. I was co-hosting the talk, uh, talk sport with Alan Brazil. I was doing ITV. I was, I was doing a lot of BBC Wales. I could speak Welsh. So, so straight away from football, I never... I was gambling, but I was never really struggled for work, if you like. So I was straight in. I moved to Wales. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, I, I do understand that, that, that people, you know, they... they, they 
footballers, they, they, they live a, a certain lifestyle. They live a certain way of living. And then when you retire, you've got debts. Uh, you, you're not, you're not any, anywhere near earning a fraction of what you did. Um, you've got bills to pay. You've got a family. All of a sudden, a lot of people break up because... Yeah. Do, you know you know, what the, do you know what the stat is on that? No. 60%. Um, of marriages fail within three years of a professional footballer yeah. retiring. Yeah, because it's very, it's very stressful, Ben. Because you know you you used to a, a, you're accustomed to a certain way of living. You got your lovely car on the drive. You got money coming in every month. Now, there's no worry. But it's a simple thing. There's no worry about you're not worried about putting the food on the table, paying all your bills. All of a sudden that stops, and if you haven't been wise. And if you haven't put your money into property or um, stuff like savings plans or things like this, uh, pensions, whatever it is, uh, because not everybody's wise. People spend what they've got, you know, and people make mistakes. And yeah. going back then, you know, you might have done a lot of things differently, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, we're all the same, yeah. you know, we're all the same. But that that's why I think, you know, it's, uh, and then the stress comes and then the anxiety, you know, and then and then, and then then there's children around and things like this. And and then people break up, unfortunately, you know, it's, it is it is quite sad because when you started out, you know, you you and your missus, you, you were really, really tight, connecting, things were going the right way. And then for some whatever reason, you know, it's a separation, and I've been through a divorce, and it really is not a nice experience. Cancer. Yeah. Uh, oh, everybody, unfortunately, knows or has lost somebody to, to to cancer. Yeah. We really we came very close to losing you. Yeah. Where Where were you when you found out that you had cancer? Well, I had a lump. I had a lump. I'm going to try and do this without getting too emotional because this kills me. Um, I, I had a lump on my testicle for about four years and I knew it was there. Um, but I, I never quite went to check with the doctor like I should have done. Because you were scared? Um, wasn't scared at that time when I first came into contact with the lump. But it gradually got bigger. But during that time, I was scoring goals. I was moving from club to club. It was there for about four years. Where were you? At the I was probably at somewhere like Wimbledon, Celtic, Coventry, and it was there. So I retired at West Brom, and uh, I showed my wife my lump one day, and she went, oh, my goodness. She says, well, how long has that been there? It was all sort of in, inside my scrotum, like... Um, one of my testicles, it had a lump on one of the one of the testicles. And it had turned into like a nut size to a Malteser size to then a grape size. It had grown that big. And she said, you better go and see the doctor about that at West Brom. So, yeah, no problem, I'll go and see the doctor. I come home and I told her a little white lie. I said, I've been to see the doctor, everything's fine, don't worry about it. So subconsciously in my mind, I, I almost knew that. I was going to get bad news, you know. Um, so I started to get these headaches. You know, I was, my wife couldn't understand why I needed so much sleep. I was sleeping for like all the time. Coming home from training, laying on, laying on the couch, sleeping till six o'clock, having my tea, going to bed at eight. Wasn't natural, do you know? Yeah. Um, I was almost falling asleep at the traffic lights, you know, and they were red. I was stopping and then it was just ridiculous really um so something wasn't quite right you know something wasn't right and you know that i think i knew when you jump out of bed in the morning as a man some mornings you got out of bed you're fresh you're great you want to take on the world next minute you're like Ugh. well i was then you know i was like struggling i put a lot of weight on around my neck and didn't look well didn't feel well so then we went to um um i remember that we moved to wales and uh, I started to get these ridiculous headaches. It was like, yeah, your worst ever migraine you can think of. So I went and got, um, I went and got a diagnosis, and I was diagnosed with testicular cancer that spread to my lungs and onto my brain. So I can remember the the the, um, the, the, um, the specialist saying, John, over the next three four months, you're going to go through some like rigorous treatment. 
I wish you well. You know, it was almost like he was saying bye bye to me because the cancer had spread to my lungs and onto my brain. So I was rushed into hospital uh, with mind blowing headaches that settled me down. I had two brain operations while I was in hospital. I had over 60 sessions of chemotherapy, two emergency brain operations, l operations on my lungs. I had a tracheotomy there. Um, and it wasn't so much the operations, it was the time in hospital where I'd never been used to being in hospital. Like, I'd always, like, been on the grass outside, you know. So it was difficult just basically just, like, being a patient. That was the hardest thing, just, like, being in a bed all day, you know, not doing nothing. Parents come in, brothers come in, friends come in. And then I went into when I went to the um, into the ITU, there was only allowed three people to um, to be in there because of risk of infection after my brain operation, and kids carry infections through kids in classes and stuff. So that was difficult, obviously not seeing my kids. Um, but through the grace of God, I you know I I I, I fought. I, you know I did like what I could, but I just think that. Um, you know, most people will will fight for their life, but I think the key element was is that I got a bit of luck. You know, I, I I put it down to luck because at one stage it looked very very bleak. The cancer had spread to my brain, and um, I had ten tumours on my head, um, and I was in desperate trouble. I was. What, pe on. what period was it from having all of those sessions to when you when you got the all clear? Um, well, you never get. The all clear, really. Um, it's a way, you know. It's a way for now, because. But do you, do you have to go back like every six? Yeah, months or so? I, when I first came out of hospital, I had to go back in to finish my chemotherapy program. I lost seven stone in weight. They looked, you know, all gaunt, and because of the chemo and everything, and what chemotherapy can actually do, it's it's destroys your insides. It destroys those um, those really nice white cells. Yeah. That yeah. keep you alive, your immune system, and then it it attacks your immune system and it attacks all the red cancer cells. So it stops for no one. Chemotherapy it just rips your insides, destroys it, and then your immune system is down. And I can remember at one stage I couldn't stop coughing, and I thought they thought it was the, I caught pneumonia on the ward, and a lot of elderly people they 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 pass. Because of the pneumonia, pneumonia not the it's not the cancer. cancer. They fight and the, because they haven't got the, the immune system to fight it back at it. So see, so luckily for me, I was able. I was young. I had strong lungs and. Because you're, you're, how old are you at this point? Thirty. Um, I would have been 34? 33, 32, 33, Yeah, and they were giving me th these tests, like to blow into a bag, just to test my lungs, and I was bursting the bag. I had strong lungs. I'd never been a, I'd never been a smoker. So. Um, that side side of things, I thought, well, I can deal with that, you know. Oh, mate! And mm. those six those, those sessions of chemotherapy, what, what, over what period of time was that? Was that over? A, it was over year? about three months for me. I, I had yeah, over about three months. You go in um, twice a week. You go on a Tuesday and a Thursday. You have a day off in 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 the week, and you have four or five sessions. You have different bags, and it bleeps, bleep, 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 and it, it's into a Heckman line. Uh, Hickman lighting in my chest because they couldn't find a, a vein in my arm because they, all oh, my arms had been butchered. They couldn't find a vein, so they did it from my chest. It's called a Hickman line. That everything comes from there, all your bloods, all the intake of the chemo. I was on this special chemo called bleomycin that can affect the, your lung, which it did. I had a bad lung for a while. Um, so the hospital pulled out all the stops for me. They put me in a little private room. So um, I wasn't quite exposed to everyone in that, you know, because the cameras were outside and the press were all over it and stuff. So it was a really, like, tough six weeks, you know, of my life with, you know, just just dealing with, you know, that side of things really. But, you know, through the um, through the grace of God, I was able to come through that. And... Uh, and obviously since then, everything has stayed away. I got regular checks for 10 years, every six months, 12 months. And I think from a hospital point of view with testicular cancer, it's like 10 years and then you're officially discharged. Um, they don't want to see you anymore unless you've got you know any issues and I can go back and see the right people in the right authorities and places. 
But yeah, it was pretty scary at the time, yeah. Let's talk about what you're up to now. Yeah. Um, so what you achieved on the pitch was phenomenal. The battles that you've gone through is by far even um, better than what you achieved on the on the pitch. You're making a difference now, telling your story and talking about the workshops and, and stuff that you're doing. You're still doing some bits and pieces with media? Yeah, I've got plenty on in terms of, um, you know, I have, I have a radio show every week in Glasgow called Go Radio. Uh, me and my wife, we, we've set up the, the John Hartson Recovery Workshops where we're intending on going out and, and speaking to young people, speaking to businesses about about the danger signs and the um, and the pitfalls of getting into gambling addiction and because gambling addiction is 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 absolutely destroying people. You know, there's so many gamblers out there, silent gamblers, more gamblers, you know, more compulsive gamblers and addicts you know, are taking their life more so than any other addiction, now gambling addiction. And um, it's the silent addiction where your partner doesn't know, your children doesn't know, your boss don't know, because it's quite, um, it's, it's it's something that you don't like to share, you know. Uh, and it's like if somebody's on drugs and he's jumping all over the place or somebody's drinking and he's yeah, making yeah. a fool of himself. What, what, but with the, with the gambling, it's like you can keep it. What do you think football can do to, to help that and what I mean by that is almost every single football club mm. probably with the exception of MK Dons I know Pete Winkham and the chairman there yeah he's I think him and Forest Green Rovers and I'm pretty certain there's one more uh, sort of no don't they don't want to work with any betting company but every other every other club does yeah could you see I know there's there's already Premier League have said that they, I think front of shirt sponsors are going to go within yeah, the next couple the of years. advertising brands and stuff, and they've taken them away as well. What what more can they do? I think what more they can do is get ex-footballers who have, who have got themselves in a place where they don't gamble anymore and they've got the education, they've got the 10 years experience yeah. of, of going to GA and, and uh, doing the 12 steps and uh, being in a place where they're trusted these people need to go in to clubs and educate these young kids, these young um, academy players. If the older ones want to listen, then I feel sometimes if somebody had come in when I was at my midst of gambling, I might not have listened, but I might have. And it might have made it might have made a change. Yeah. I think there's got to be more that's being done. I don't think there's anything. It's almost like you know letting them carry on, let, letting them get to a place where it's too late. Uh, I, I think there's, you know, th there's lots of different gambling companies out there that do work really hard, and they do go into schools. I think there's got to be more. I think it's education when they're young, yeah. um, get them when they're really young. So almost remind them of where you were as a professional and you're passionate now it. of stopping these kids get yeah. to a place where you were. Um, not scare them, but almost try and educate them, you know, remind them of what can happen. Um, because It's that awareness factor. It's all, I think it's all about awareness. Mm. I think it's all about the awareness and the FA, I think, um, should be doing more. Um, FA Premier League, FA, PFA Premier League, PFA certainly, PFA certainly. They say they're, the, you know, they, they take care of all the players, but they need to show a bit more when it comes to gambling. Listen, they may well be doing. I don't know what the what the stats are and what 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 they're currently doing. So I apologise if they are putting something forward for uh, for young gamblers because gambling gambling is rife they reckon half of every single football team gambles really that's the stat and uh you know gambling is rife in society not just in in sport in rugby cricket football athletic snooker anything darts gambling in society is ruining people's lives it is it is tearing couples apart because it's an addiction and it's a horrible addiction. You know, the stories that I hear in GA when I go of, you know, somebody saving up for three years to for their daughter to get married and they manage to do it and then and then the the gambler goes in and, and steals the money um, and and all of a sudden they go explain to the daughter so or the wife yeah. can't get married, let them down is you know, the promises you make as a 
as a gambler, you know, because you're ill. You know, you're not very well. You, you know, you're, you, you've got an addiction. Yeah, there. The, the silent addiction. I think that's a that's a that's a good yeah, it's good summary, good description. I think so because nobody can tell, and yeah. it, it's generally in your mood swings. It's in your demeanour. Um, and then what happens is you get a little bit of money. You, you go and win. You think you're great. You share it around. You give it to your you give it to your kids. You but by the end of the week you're asking for it back. Mm. This is what it does to you. It, it destroys you. It destroys people. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm I'm absolutely thrilled to bits that I've come through that period well of my life. Yeah. And now you're making a difference. Well, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I think it's important. You get you get people out there that that have been there, seen it, and then you can make a difference. You you're in a position. It's not tongue in cheek. It's not pie in the sky. Yeah. It's experience. It's knowledge. It's knowing. And I think there's more people that should be out there. What was your biggest ever bet? Oh, I think I won quite a bit of money um, at um, a toaster one year. I think I, I toaster did, toaster yeah near Milton Keynes. It's down the road from here. Yeah, yeah isn't it quite near? Well, it's not. It's not. Quite, it's a dog track now. It's not it? too far from Luton, and we used to go to toaster, and it was coming up the hill, the the, the, the finish, and I think I did the place pot. I don't. I don't want to say numbers because I don't want to. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it doesn't sort of float my boat or my ego. Or, um, if anything, it would, it would upset people. But um, I think I did the play spot, and I, and I came away with a, with a. They couldn't actually pay me, so somebody had to go to the bank and get the money out for me. Um, and then within within a couple of months, couple of weeks, it had gone. Do you know, it's it's, it's not really winning. It, it's almost like a loan. You know, when you win in, so you never you never see a, a skin bookmaker, nah, do you? you? You're loaning the money because you know, and I I just I feel sorry for the people that are in the midst of the gambling crisis, and they don't see it, and they are going to end up possibly divorced, possibly bankrupt, possibly out of their house, possibly no relationship with their children, and then it's the terrible one yeah. that I just talked about. Because it ain't gonna get better if you're still gambling. It's only gonna get worse. So I feel sorry for them people that are in and they're struggling to get out. And for me, it was that rock bottom place. That was my out. Some people don't quite go to go there. And some people don't wanna stop. Some people don't think they have a problem. I didn't. But then when you, you know, when you hit that rock bottom place, it was there for everybody to see. Before we end, um, I want to just do a couple of quick fire questions yeah. on your career. Mm. So, best player that you played with? With, I can't separate Dennis Bergkamp or Henrik Larsson. I think Henrik at Celtic was, was phenomenal for the three years I played with him. He was just fabulous. How, how long were you with, did you play with? I was up at Celtic for three years and then, and then Henrik left to go to Man United. And yep. then he went to Barcelona, won a Champions League. And how long did you play with Burkamp for? Uh, Dennis, two seasons. Um, and me and Wrighty played, and then Dennis played in behind sometimes. Is it true that he, he, he for European games, he'd get the train? or uh, Bought, I think. He'd find one way to get there, but it might take he wouldn't him, fly? He might take him 36 hours, yeah. Yeah, I don't know the club were happy about it, but it, it was Burkamp. <laughs> if you can get Dennis on for ten minutes, he might just make the difference, you know. But he was, um, he was unbelievable. He, he was just, he floated about, you know. Well, everybody's seen him. I think if you look at Dennis Burkamp's best hundred goals, yeah. or hundred goals, like almost 80, 80 of them would be goal of the season contenders. He never scored a simple goal. Yeah, you know, he had so much. The one talent. against Newcastle. Oh, the three against Leicester. Yeah, 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 yeah. I go on and on and on. Yeah, you know, yeah. the, the goal the goal he scored for Holland against Argentina, Argentina in the World Cup. Nutmeg, Nut, that, yeah, nutmeg yeah. Diala. Yeah. The long ball from De Moore, wasn't it? Great touch. Yeah. Uh, but he he was brilliant. He's a really nice man as well, Dennis. Very humble. Really, really nice man. A lot of time for him. Yeah. Hardest defender that you played against, or t toughest? The one well, that your you... pal was up there, Razor. Um, <laughs> Razor Ruddock. He uh, he was cynical. Razor. He try and hurt you. And he meant it, you know, he would do that on the pitch when he was young and brave and, you know. Um, Martin Keown was tough, 
And I, I say that lad Ayala, 125 caps for Ayala, for Argentina, Roberto Ayala. Where did you play against him? I played against him for Celtic in the Champions League. We played uh, Valencia, Rafa Benitez is Valencia. They won the Champions League, I think it was in 2002. And then we met them in the group stages. Um, I think we beat them 1-0 at home. Because he went very, he went very big, Ayala, was he? No, he about five foot seven, five foot eight, but he was rock. I mean, you know, dirty, dirty, cynical. Come down your calves, just toe poke the ball away. He could jump six feet, hell of a jump, nasty, aggressive, Argentinian. And I used to look across the the, the tunnel, and I used to look at the defenders and think, I'll, I'll have a, I'll I'll do all right today because I can bully him. He's not physically, yeah. I can roll him. I can hold. I can hold him off, make him look a bit silly. I can pass. He ain't gonna get near me. I'm too strong. I'm too big. Yeah. So there were several. Uh, I looked at across the dressing room. I thought, I get the better you. And I, I saw that. I saw Ayala, and I'm thinking, yeah, that'd be all right tonight. Yeah, at the Mustaya, like forty five thousand. I never got a kick. I never won a header. I never got a kick. And I walked off, and I thought. I need to get better, you know. I've got to improve. And I was at the peak of my powers. I was playing for Wales. I was number 10 for Celtic, playing in the Champions League with Larson and great players like that. Um, and I just thought, this, this guy, that, that's the level, you know. Yeah. Yeah, top of the tree. Brilliant. Um, and lastly, I, t- I told you before when I asked you to come on or I was explaining, that I, I do think that there is a... A lot, a load of transferable skills from elite athletes into Civvy Street, so to speak. And I think professional sports teams, there's so much synergy with businesses, the way that they're set up and the, the, the formation that we play in terms of yeah. departments and having the right people in the right position. Who was the best man manager? Who got the best out of John Artson? Um Well, I failed four medicals before I went to Celtic. Um, and then Martin O'Neill. Martin O'Neill. What, sorry, I didn't know that. Four? Yeah, I failed four medicals. I failed a medical for seven million at Spurs. I was going Arsenal, West Ham, Spurs. Not many would have done that. It was George Graham that was re-signing me. Yeah. David Pleat, who gave me my debut at Luton as my manager. George Graham was manager. And uh, David Pleat, chief executive. Sorry, George Graham, manager. Yeah. Um, Alan Sugar, chairman and the doctor was uh, Dr King at Spurs and I was going for 7 million I spent the whole day um, around Spurs with George signing signing a 5 year contract 7 million at 22 years of age and I failed the medical on what on, what, what? on my knee because I oh, previously just had a little arthroscopy and you had no was, idea that you... no just sorry John can't, can't do it because there's something showed in your knee on the scan failed the medical at Glasgow Rangers before I went to Celtic, on my knee, flew up in Sir David Murray's private jet. I was signing for Rangers. Oh, I didn't know that. Either. Failed a medical, and then six months later, Martin O'Neill says to me, "Unless you've got a hole in your heart, you're signing for Celtic." So I signed for Celtic. I've created success against. So Rangers. what happened at the medical? With again, my knee. I bet Martin still wanted to. Martin, yeah, I don't think I think I had two scans. Um, a very small medical. Martin had made his mind up. I met him at the Sports Book Awards a couple of weeks ago at the Oval. What a, what a lovely gentleman he Fantastic is. Fantastic man, yeah, really and, good. And to be fair, Ben, I, he wouldn't let nobody in. I can't say I knew him until 10 years ago when he started to come and support my charity golf day and, you know, and he's a real gentleman. Um, and it, that's that's when he was, he come out really of him because when he was managing, you know, it was very, very difficult to get to know Martin. He'd, he'd keep you there. He really? really would. He kept you guessing though at the team. He kept you guessing about what he thought of you, you know. And it was it was clever. It was really clever management. Um, not many really could say that they knew in what was going on inside his head. And now he's retired. I, I I find him quite relaxed, and we'll have a glass of wine and we'll talk about the days at Celtic and other things as well. He did the foreword for my book. Um, Please don't go, which is which is a very uh, emotional book. Emotional book because it's a cancer story, you know. My sister features in it and things like that. Um, but no, an absolute an absolute gentleman. I would probably say Martin, because he took the chance on me. Um, without Martin O'Neill, I wouldn't have played for Celtic, and I had such an amazing time five years in Glasgow. Um, but there's others. There's 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 Harry Redknapp who was brilliant at West Ham. 
Um, there's Joe Kinnear who took me to Wimbledon. Joe was a good in the dress, so people wouldn't think it, but Joe was great at getting you ready for games, yeah. getting you up for games, talking to you about the opposition, things like that. Um, I, my, my, uh, Mark Hughes played for Wales, Bellamy, Hearts and Giggs, that was our front three for Wales. Um, Gordon Strachan was great. Uh, and there's probably loads more. There's John Toshak. There's, there's yeah, I see. Brian Robson, David yeah, Pleat. Yeah, I see. I forgot that you played for Brian Robson at West Brom as well. Yeah, West Brom. Robbo signed me. Yeah, yeah, West Brom. Great, great guy, Brian Robson. Just a shame with Robbo, really. I, I, he never quite got the best out of me. Probably the only club where I never quite got to a level where I was satisfied with my own performances and play uh, at West Brom. I think I was carrying the cancer. I was carrying lots of different things. Um, and that was probably the only club, really, where I never quite hit the heights of other clubs that I played for. Listen, John, um, I just want to thank you. I think you've... I've had the pleasure of meeting you on a number of occasions over the yeah. last 10 years. You're probably one of the most inspiring people I've, I've met and I've had the pleasure of meeting because I, I think what you've been through... Uh, I, I can't even imagine what it would have been like, but the well, fact I'm, that you're—I'm I'm out the other end now. Yeah, so. and it, and it, and it's about sharing and sharing yes, that, and I, and I look at it and I think, yeah. Thanks, man. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate.